All righty. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. The title for tonight's teaching is What a Week. There's just too many verses uh, for me to list or to pick one, so I didn't. And the date today is April the 6th, 2023. I had uh, joked on our uh, Facebook page um, that based on the conversation that we had at our house, this one could go the distance. Oh, look at that. Come on. <laughs> hey, Renee, glad that you're back. What a, what a, a one to come back to. I love it. Michael, good evening. <laughs> I love it. I just, I might have to get like a shirt or something. That's awesome. Valerie, glad you could tune in. Hello and good evening. Hopefully everybody's drinking their coffee to be able to stay awake. I mean, I did, you know, I had, so I so I joked on the Facebook page saying, you know, based on our conversation that that we had in person, come on, see, Bob knows. Hey, Bob and Irma. Oh, look at that. Oh, hi, Tiffany. Brent. Hello to both of you. Oh, see, look at that. D's chiming in. That was the longest six minutes ever, right? Oh, look at there. All right. So when I joked on the Facebook page saying that uh, this one could go the distance, you guys for a while now have been, uh, I'll say, egging me on to go till midnight. And the conversation that we had here on Tuesday, on Tuesday we start at six o'clock. So we went from t from six until seven thirty. There's a there's a, a hard stop at at seven thirty. So an hour and a half when we're here at the house. Um, but then when I do this live on Thursdays here, um, it's really open ended. It's it goes in, until it's supposed to be done. The conversation was so great, and we have so much that we can go through. If there was a time with a topic that I could see easily going quite a ways into the night, this one has it. Um, I did see a pretty big typo on the, on the sheets that I um, passed out, so I apologize. Come on, tonight is the night. Valerie's ready for it. She's all good. Bob's got the energy drinks. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Renee, you just let's do this thing, right? Um, so I do apologize for the 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 print off that I had um, sent out to everybody the on the first page between verses fourteen and verse fifteen. There's a a, a title in there that um, I did not delete since I do just a lot of copy and, and paste. Um, come on, this is I believe we're all ready for revelations tonight. I'm in with you on that. I mean, it's just, I might be the one talking, but there is many a time that 
uh, the things that I'm saying, I'm hearing for the first time along with you. And that might be really strange for some of you, but uh, that's the way that it happens. Uh, uh, I can give uh, somebody a word and come on, see, and um, I can use words that I don't understand what they are. Hey, Cody and Kevin and Shelly. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. The gang is filling up fast. Absolutely. Grab a, a Cody, a, a glass of milk and a, with this sandwich. See? I mean, you got to be ready. I mean, if, if we're going the distance, it's just going to be what it is. But um, so we'll see. So um, the conversation that we had was beautiful. Um, I talked about the, the sheet having an error in it, but when I post it onto the Facebook page, I have corrected that error. And then um, there's things that when I'm praying, um, speak, given a word, a prophetic word, whatever, uh, sometimes I am hearing it because I'm like, wow, that was, that was very enlightening there. I've never looked at it that way, whatever. And so when you guys... Uh, some of the times, uh, well, many times we'll say, uh, this conversation, and even though it's kind of one-sided, you guys get to put some comments down, and so it's, it is some back and forth stuff, but this is very much, um, you could call open heavens in this communication of just, this is what God wants to reveal to us in this time with this and so we'll just see because it was a great conversation that we had and it ended way too soon so that hour and a half went by like that and there's just so much to cover because i've got depending on how you count the pages there, there, there's four pages. <laughs> See, they always, all right. They, so there, there, there's four pages, but it's only two sheets of paper. My grandson was here last week and he was like, well, that book doesn't have 432 pages. You see what they did here? They put a number on the front and on the back. Oh, that's only, that's one page. That's not two pages. So it's not 400, and, or it's not 832, it's only 416. So, depending on how you count, um, if I would have listed out the verses that I would like to talk about with this title being What a Week, uh, this, this would be, right now I'm going to say this is four pages. Sorry, Finn. This would easily be 10 to 12 pages. So, with all that being said, now that we're into it almost, what, nine minutes now close to, if we get started with this. So, so this is, since we're um, Monday, Thursday, this is, we're leading right up. This is the week before Easter. We all have Easter this, this Sunday. And so you've got this holy week. You have all these different names that that we put on this. And um, oh, as a pause, just everybody, just pause for a minute here. I want to. Um, D, do you have to leave early again, or are you gonna stick it out through the through the whole time? Inquiring minds want to know. All right. So, see, all right, so, Rossi, Ross, see, even before I get here, that was why I was saying so, taking so long to say hello, because my brother and yours, Rossi, is now in the house. See? 
everybody else that comes now can just be you know icing on the cake frosting on the cake cherry on the top whatever uh, chocolate syrup on your ice cream um, sprinkles however it is now we've got all sorts of all i mean i just i just love every one of you guys it's just good so what a week man <sighs> okay you're in georgia man okay all right well thank you renee um we'll see rossi i've got a, a partial prayer kind of bouncing around so we'll we'll just see i might interrupt um are teaching a little bit here just to kind of see um or instead i guess i will just tell you okay rossi before i get started here rossi my brother i speak into you life i speak into you a calmness and a and a perfection of mind and spirit body and soul i i announce to all that you are to rest in the things of God that that it is like you get to be in this boat that's going down the river and it's going the right way and you don't have to worry about steering it because the current is taking you and so that's where you get to be in this moment of time for you is to rest in this comfortable chair that you have in this boat wrapped in the love that your brothers and sisters have for you and that your father has for you that our Father has for you. Breathe in that understanding, that acceptance, and rest in his presence. All right. Amen and amen. Yes, Renee, you can have that one too. D said so, so we're going to go with yes. All right. Now, whew, amen and amen. Let's get into what a week. I don't know about you all, but this blows me away on how much stuff was documented of all the stuff that happened this week leading up to the resurrection it's all right so here's where we're going to start we're going to look at matthew so um all of these verses i bounce between books but it's the first four books in the new testament matthew mark luke and john all four of them have accounts of this last week of before Jesus was crucified and buried and then rose again. All of them have certain parts of it. And so I'm looking at stuff and I'm like, this happened during this week? This happened during? What a week! So let's see what Revelation... Let's see what we can glean from this. And one of the people had asked if, why I thought, or if there was a significance to all of this stuff happening in just this one week. And my response was, I think this was Jesus's every week. And it was just that it wasn't documented as well as this one. So, 
here we go. Let's let's get into this before our poor Miss Tiffany fades off to to sleep, which she should do sooner than later anyway. Uh, you know, we love you, but you know, you should also get your sleep because you're you're awake for the day before I get up just to go back to sleep. So no. Anyway. So let's first go into Matthew, verse 21, verses 1 through 11. So what a week. So here's where it starts. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage, or whatever that is, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there with a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone... <laughs> so just verse 2. <laughs> 2.25 in the morning. That's not... Two... Some of you are like, well, 2.25 p.m., that ain't so bad. No, that's 2.25 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you for sharing part of your evening with us. That's just, man. All right. So, Jesus, how many? Think about this. Jesus comes up to you and goes, hey, here's what I want you to do. Go to that city right there. You're going to find this donkey and, the, and a colt that are tied up at this address. What I want you to do is I want you to take them for me. <laughs> what? No, I'm sorry, but if you're thinking, who is a good Christian? Um, stealing somebody's animals does not make the list. <laughs> it's just this. And yet... Verse 2, go to the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, if you were honest with yourself, how many people, how many of you, if God told you to do this tomorrow, how many of you would actually do it? <clears throat> I'm guessing a pretty small portion of you because you some of you guys are going, well, no, God won't because, because that would be breaking one of the laws. Yeah, D, you would. I know it. Renee probably would too, but... <clears throat> but you look at it and you go, well, that goes against the rules. That, we can't do that. I ain't stealing somebody else's stuff. How is that loving? Todd, you just tell me that. How is, how is that loving for if you're going to go and rip off somebody? How, how I'm, I'm just saying. Verse 2 tells us that. <laughs> See? D saying crazy for Jesus, right? You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, people, you know, have their opinions and all that. Now the the worldly um counterfeit to this verse two is not hearing what God is telling you and directing you and then blaming it on God saying, God made me do it. God told me to, da 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 da. You say, well, God will, God would never tell you to do something that goes against His word. I'm pretty sure thou shalt not steal is in there somewhere. And yet here's Jesus telling two of his homies to go lift this.
You see this? This is, I'm into this two verses, and it's taken us five minutes just to talk th about those two verses. Whew, I should just put a little sign up, or put a little piece of paper up blocking the time, and then just let it go and see what happens. Anyway. All right, verse 3. If anyone, sa if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately they will send them. Now, that's a good word to back up. So verse 3 is a good word for you to have to back up verse 2. Because if I'm going to go and take something from somebody else, if God's going to tell me, go and steal this, he's also going to help me by telling the other person that I'm coming and that it's okay that I do what I'm going to do. So if that doesn't happen, I maybe should be thinking about the fact if I actually heard what heard God or if I heard myself or maybe somebody else. Verse 3, Jesus says, you just tell them that the Lord has need of them. Not even the fact that, that God told me to do this. No, nope. I'm going to come and I'm going to take your donkey and your colt. And I'm doing it because God needs them. All right, Christine. I was wondering if you were going to make an appearance tonight as well. Wonderful that you're here. We're just getting started. I don't remember if you told me to send you the verses or not, um, Christine. So... Um, I don't recall if I sent them to you. If I didn't, right now we're in Matthew 21. We're at verse 3. Hopefully you brought your coffee. I brought water. But not too much because, you know, anyway. He is going to tell the other person his he's going to talk to that other person that's going to be affected by whatever it is that you're doing and they're going to be okay with it yep good water i use a, a zero filter kevin oh my goodness and we have we have well water so our water is is good but man uh, a zero filter And usually cold, like 35 degrees, kind of kind of cold. But, all right. So that's how one of the ways that we can understand that when God, when we feel that we're being directed by God for something. Oh, speaking of which, so we're going to do another pause. Sorry, but this is the way it's going to work. Um, we have a friend, we meaning not just here in this household, but... Uh, some of us in, in our community here have a friend that um, got a word from God that said uh, to move. And so we live in Wisconsin, they live in Wisconsin, and they're going to be moving uh, actually to Texas, um, back home for um, where, where they started life. And uh, they are uh, not in a financial position to make that happen, yet it's it's happening. They're going to be done um, in the place that they're staying at the end of this month. And so I told them that I would uh, talk with my people and just say if anybody would like to help them, um, just talk to me about it. Um, and we can deal with the finances. I can, I can direct you to that person or... 
you can get the finances to us and then we can get them to them um, since we are um, a recognized nonprofit, the 501c3 uh, we can deal with it that way as well but just so you know they heard from god um, it it was legit it was a it was a hearing there was confirmation with it all that stuff but if you would like to if you feel led to um, so into that to be able to help get them um, down to Texas, uh, reach out to me. So message me, text me, call me, email me, because all you guys have my email address. Well, some of you have my email address, but everybody can reach me through here. So there you go. All right. Now let's get back to this. Really? I mean, let's focus, Todd. Come on. Rain this thing in. I know. I heard you. This is, it's just like Tuesday night, isn't it, Bob? Man, I completely lost control. There was all sorts of fun stuff happening. So anyway, okay, Matthew 21. <clears throat> so verse 3, he says, no, they'll let you. You just tell them that the Lord has need of them, and they'll, they'll let them, they'll send you on your way with them. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. So here's another check mark. Did Jesus fulfill all the things that the prophet said in the Old Testament? It says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So we pause there. So that was verse 5, Matthew 21, verse 5. So you have this, your king is coming into Jerusalem. But he's not coming on a great steed, not a war horse. He is coming on a donkey. Even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. There's nothing to be throwing a party about with that. What? And he's like, no. I want to show you. I want you to see that it has nothing to do with this assumed stature that you would present. That's not where your worth is. That's not where your stature is. That's not where your power and authority lie. It lies in what God says. And there's more with it, but we'll go. Let's see. Verse uh, 6 says, all right, so then the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the coat, colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. So that's where you get the palm, palm branches. Um, because again, right, Palm Sunday, last Sunday. That's all right. Verse 9 The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, so check this. When he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirring, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's see, what does Renee say? God's kingdom is upside down to ours here. We'll see, and... 
which is upside right and the world is upside down because it's a counterfeit of what God's kingdom is. The world takes it and since they can't create anything on their own, counterfeits and replicates and duplicates and takes and just tweaks it a little here and there and then says that it's theirs and that they came up with it when in all actuality it came from the kingdom of God. See? God's is right. You can look at it as upside down and that's and that's and, and it's right. It is the opposite. Yep. I mean, I get you, Renee. You you were right on because everybody was thinking that ours is just upside down. So that's all that's why you said it, is because that's the way that people understand it. The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus. No, I thought Jesus wasn't just a prophet. What happened? What? No, Jesus, this is the prophet Jesus. What? All right, prophet, I would say don't get too hung up on words, titles like this. All right? You have the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, the fivefold ministry. People get really... They really hang their ministry on these titles. Really? Because even if God gave it to you, it's still because God did it. Not you. And since you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, you can function in all five because it's not yours you might have a, a leaning to one to the other but a title of i am i don't know i i mean you guys call me pastor todd i love it i it god's called me pastor there isn't anything wrong with it um, i'm a teacher and that works Prophet, all a prophet is, is somebody that speaks the words of God. So God tells them something in the Old Testament. God would tell them something, and then they would speak it out. Titles make man feel strong, better belief in their self. Yeah, Kevin, that's right. I mean, that's, and, and so I can say, well, I have been promoted from prophet to apostle, because apostle is the top of the food chain. Um, No. Nope. Nope. Not at all. So anyway, so it says, this is the prophet Jesus. So they're trying to help people to understand. You've heard. Oh, well, apparently Stephen and Tabitha. They haven't commented yet, but they're watching or they will be watching. So hello to both of you. Interesting. Okay. And they're like, no, no, no. I want to say, because you're thinking that he's a prophet, so I want to tell you, yeah, the prophet Jesus. It doesn't reduce who he is. It helps you to understand who they're talking about, who this is. The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, we all know that nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Right? Because there's a verse that talks about that. All right, people. So here we go. This is the first day of this week that we get to talk about this. So now Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he knows in just a few short days, he's going to go through the whole crucifixion stuff and then he's going to be buried and then after a short time then God is going to raise him from the dead 
And so, this sets the scene as to where we are. What a week. So, all right, one of the things that, that um, I'm getting, I, I'm going back to. Verse 8, so Matthew 21, verse 8, says, Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. Um, and then before that, verse 7, um, they laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats, and most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches. One of the things that signified your status back then was the outer garment that you wore. So if you were a beggar, if you had legal right to beg back then, you were given a cloak, a coat, if you will. And by wearing that, then the people in general would know that you did whatever was necessary to, you know, you checked all the boxes, filled out all the, all the forms that needed it, you passed all the tests or failed, however that would work, that said that you had right to be able to beg. Right, was it uh, Joseph in the Technicolor uh, coat deal? That coat, so now we've backed up a long ways. That coat had long sleeves. Those things went at least that long, if, if not long, okay? And it went all the way down. I don't know if it touched the ground, but it was past the ankles kind of a deal. That coat said, I don't do any work. The coat that the father calls for in the prodigal son. Again, because if you're going to do work, you need your sleeves rolled up. So then you could get your hands dirty and you could not have that. Just like the, the longer part... Um, it talks about girding up your, your loins. So, you know, you're picking up your dress. You know, you're you're picking it up and tucking it in so then your legs are um, easier to move and it's just easier to do your work. In here, they're taking those coats and they're laying them on the donkey and the colt for Jesus to come in on. They're putting them on the ground. I guess so you can see my answer. Where the donkey and the colt are bringing him in. Because, why? We'll see. Oh, D. Well, I'm glad that you're back. Why is this important for me to point out that they're putting their coats on the donkey and the colt and Jesus is sitting on them, as well as they're putting them on the road where the donkey and the colt are walking him in? Well, when you understand that the coats represent their performance in life, now maybe that helps make a little more little more sense. It's not helping him get in. They're saying we don't need these anymore. Jesus is above. The things of Christ are above my performance. So there you go. That's the first 11 verses. And I'm telling you, we've got some 
He's just making it in. Just making it into the town. And now some of the stuff that I have put in here, I'm not exactly sure on, so did this happen on Sunday? Did this happen on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? What? I don't know because there's a few things that are like, one of the one of the books says, you know, it happened. It happened on Monday, and somebody else says that it happened on Sunday or Tuesday or whatever. So I'm not getting hung up on that. All I want to do is look at what a week. Okay. So he's in town now, and there's a big buzz happening that the fact that he's there. So now we look at Mark, chapter 11. Come on. See? <laughs> yeah. Um, chapter 11, verses 13 through 25. And again, this is, um, I get through um, between verse 14 and verse 15. Um, I missed deleting um, part of it when I when I copied it over, so I apologize for that. So it says, seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. All right, so does everybody understand what's going on here? Hopefully, Jesus sees a tree. He goes, all right, well, that's a fig tree. I'm going to go see if I can get a fig off of that. He goes to it, only finds leaves. And why? Because it was not the season for figs. You guys would think I'm a little out of it if I went to an apple tree having it not be apple producing season. If I'm going to expect an apple from an apple tree, I would think that I should probably only go there when the apples, what is it, just after the first frost in the fall? Hmm. So whenever, he's like, I'm going to go to that tree and I'm going to see if uh, I can pick myself a fig off that tree. And he doesn't find anything. So now verse 14, this is crazy. He says, he says to the tree, so he's talking to the tree. He says, he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. He talked to the tree. How many people would walk a little wider path around somebody else because they're talking to a tree? Jesus is doing it here. Well, see, and D and D said that she talks to her plants all the time. And that's good. I mean, it's proven that talking to them helps them. It's a good deal because, you know, the stuff that we breathe out, they take for stuff, you know, it, it helps them. And it's just this great system. He says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. That's some pretty strong language. There wasn't a prayer with it. There wasn't anything with it. If it had eyes, I would say he very well could have looked it straight in the eyes. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. You go, well, wait, time out, wait a minute. It's not my season. He was looking for figs out of season, 
and he got upset the fact that he didn't find one. Yeah, D said he cursed it. That's, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now here's a question for you. Have you ever said that to yourself? Maybe not those exact words, because more than likely you're not producing figs. How many times have you had self-talk we're not we right now I'm not even talking about you talking to somebody else. Come on, yeah, a self curse. I'm not talking about somebody else talking to you. I mean we can and it still applies. I'm just saying you personally how often have you beat yourself up even though you were not in a season to be able to produce fruit. I know what's happened. See, I mean, it's just, it, that self-talk is just crazy important. I should have done better. I can't believe how stupid I was by doing that. I know better. Why am I still doing this? This is wrong, and yet I'm still doing it. All of this beating ourselves up. I'm going to get better if I beat myself up. Really? You just wait and find out what happens to this tree. Yeah, words are alive and oh, so powerful. Yep, Renee. See? And so, Jesus says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Maybe you've said to yourself, I will never find love again. I will never have a good job. I will never have somebody in my life. like that person or yeah life and death are in the power of the tongue i what you know you you proclaim these things may no one ever eat fruit from you again and keep in mind this isn't I'm having a good time and I did good things, but I probably should have done better or more. This was, I am incapable. It is not within me to be able to do this, we'll say, good thing. And yet... We speak that death into us because maybe we've gotten hurt. Maybe we're wounded and we just beat ourselves up over not being even a better person just because we should be. And we could really go down the road and go, how many times have you done that to somebody else? How many times has somebody else done that to you? All right, yeah, fine, we deal with that. But how many times have you spoke, may no one ever eat fruit from you again? And we're not talking about the fruit of thistles and thorns. This is that good fruit. The words that you speak to somebody else should reflect the love that God has for that person. Okay, let's move on. Oh, what a week. 
All right, uh, verse 15. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturn the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Verse 15 and 16. There's another, uh, one of the other books talks about the fact that before Jesus did this, he braids a whip and goes in there fully loaded. Talk about revelations tonight. Come on. See, so so Jesus has, he braids this whip. He's like, all right, game, game on here. And he's flipping over tables. What is it saying? Driving out those who are buying and selling. Turning tables of the money changers and the seats of those who are selling doves. Now, remember, you know, you're... You might have a business of selling doves to people that need to make a sacrifice and they don't have the capacity for whatever reason to have a have a dove to be able to um, bring in for their sacrifice. And so you're there, you're this is your business, you're selling it to them. And maybe you don't have the right money. And so you have the money changers. So um, you know you have a foreign currency and the money changers then are swapping it out for currency that uh, the dove people are going to be able to accept. Sounds all good. The problem is, is that they were messing people over. They were cheating them. Yep. And so the fact that it was seemingly helpful, see, here's what the world does, upside down. Because if, if this is the temple and I require um, Todd dollars and all you have are are U.S. dollars. So I said, all right. But the exchange is based off of weight. So the money that you have weighs an ounce, weighs a pound, whatever. Weighs an ounce. Okay, fine. So then you set it on the scale and my scale says, well, that's only a half an ounce, even though it's a full ounce. I'm presenting myself as trying to help you because you need Todd dollars in order to get anything here. So I'm going to take your U.S. dollars and I'm going to give you Todd dollars in exchange. And I'm going to tell you it's one ounce for one ounce, so it's all good. But maybe the one ounce that you put on there, what I put on there that I say is one ounce is actually only a half an ounce worth. And I pass it off as the same. And then you go to the people that are selling the doves for you to be able to make your sacrifice. And you're also being taken advantage of there. So then Jesus comes in and he just cleans house. Okay. Verse 17, and he began to teach and say to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den? 
And one of the things that was pointed out uh, this week is Jesus comes in and he says, my house. That should get some people riled up. This is God's house. It's not his house. He comes in and goes, you're messing in my house. Just like, just like my house. I mean, people understand coming into someone's house. Here he's like, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all Jews. Right? No, he doesn't say that. He says, for all the nations. So for all the people, the groups of people. What? Yeah, that's what it says. You can go read it again, verse 17. Mark 11, verse 17. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations. I'll let you ponder that a little bit. Verse 18. The chief priests and the scribes heard this, and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. For the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree, the fig tree withered from the roots up. Come on. He said that the nations um, um, says that uh, it meant people. Yep. And so you have um, from all the nations, from all the peoples. It's not one specific group. It's all of the groups of people. Okay. So now we have this fig tree that all he said was may no fruit ever, wait, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. It was out of season. It was, it was, it was, I'll say it was doing what was right because it wasn't right for it to bear fruit in that season. And yet here Jesus is going, nobody ever again eats fruit from you. So now they walk by it in the morning and they see the tree withered from the roots up. And somebody else this week had pointed out, if that's kind of how it was, that's really weird. That's very interesting, especially since we've been talking about um, the kingdom of God and the world being upside down and, you know, the backwards kind of different. Because if uh, when a tree dies, it withers from the top down to the roots. And this is withered from the roots up. Because it withered from the source of nutrients which then killed the rest of the tree so verse 21 being reminded peter said to him rabbi look the fig tree which you cursed has withered hey look jesus what you said came to pass. And it could have looked differently because he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Maybe that tree just stopped producing fruit. It was still there. It was still green leaved. It was, it still went through the seasons, just never produced fruit. Cause he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, but no, instead the words that he spoke, Shoot, withered up the tree. Peter's like, hey, check that out. 
the fig tree that you cursed has withered. So now the reason why this is in here, because this, this is what a week. This is this is the beginning of his week. It's just crazy to me. Verse 22. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Um, what? That's what it says. Come on. See? <laughs> teacher, rabbi, teacher, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. Jesus said, have faith in God. And now he'll continue. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say is going to happen. It will be granted to that person. Therefore, so let's build off of that. Because of all of that, let's add to it. We're, we're springing off of that, and we're going to go further. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. That one we could get into the weeds a little bit on. Just understand that it's not based on your forgiveness. It's based on your understanding that what Jesus did is enough for you for forgiveness. Period end of that because if you still think that it's based on your performance then you're still wearing your coat and you never laid it on the donkey or the colt you never laid it on the ground that brought jesus into town you're still wearing it because that's still who you are still based on your performance. When you take that off, then you understand and you forgive other people. Because when it comes down to it, you are no better than they are. Your good that you done, that you're relying on, that you're holding on to, is no better then they're bad that you're punishing them for. You go, oh, Todd, it is. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's not. Because outside of Christ, your good is filthy rags. And in Christ, it's not your good that you do, but your belief and your faith in his good that he has done because that's where you get set free look rabbi the fig tree that you cursed has withered really huh have faith in god truly i say to you 
whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea. That's a short prayer. It's telling it what to do, just like he told the fig tree, may, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Be taken up and cast in the sea. And does not doubt, not in his heart, or in his mind, does not doubt in his heart. But believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. So what you end up doing is you say, here's this prayer and I believe it, it's going to happen. And then three minutes later when it doesn't happen, you go, Maybe I was wrong. What? Todd, I've been believing this prayer for the last 20 minutes, and it still hasn't come true yet. So? Oh, I see. Your belief is based on your natural eye seeing it. Oh, see, now we're getting somewhere. Well, but no, that, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's part of it, right? That, no, it's not. What does it say here? Does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted. Where does it say you need to see the manifestation of it in order for you to believe it? I believe that's a worldly thing, not a godly thing. Because here it says, have faith in God. Because where's the power come from? Power comes from God. How much does God love you? More than you can even understand. Have faith in God. We're barely scratching the surface surface of this week, and we're already in, over an hour into this thing. <coughs> Man, so what we could do is I could just flip to the back page and go to Matthew 27 and say, all right, he's going to the tomb. But that just doesn't seem right. That misses all sorts of stuff that we can help apply to our life right now. So, <laughs> come on, see? <laughs> We could, this could be one of my shorter ones. We just go right from the right from the front. All right, Jesus made it made it into Jerusalem. Oh, look at that! They asked for his body to be taken down, put him in the tomb, rolled the stone. What a week! No, what? No, it doesn't see. I love, I love you guys. Oh, my goodness. All right. So now I don't have verses for these because if I had verses. See? I mean, isn't that right? D, I mean, D just said this would be a perfect time to go to midnight. Because, right, what does the timing say? The timer says an hour and nine minutes right now. And we've only got through two chunks of verses. And there's three more chunks just on the first page. And we've got four pages. Based on, based on that math, it's going to take us another hour just to get through the rest of this page. Yes, yes, Valerie. <laughs> she just told me to stop looking at the clock. <clears throat> Hey, yep, there, I might, there's, there's something to be said about that because then we can just really go, because I am cognizant, I think that's the right word, of the timing because the, 
the typical person has a hard time sitting for 20 minutes. <laughs> Much less 90 minutes, two hours, or five hours. But anyway, all right. So, hopefully you guys are getting something from this. Just right now, early on, you know, we're just getting limbered up here just to really get, get going here. Come on, I love that idea, Renee. Renee said that we're not the typical types then, I guess. <laughs> I, I will take that under advisement, and I will uh, agree with you, and there isn't anything that says that you can't stop and then come back, because you can always do another one on Good Friday and finish it. See, there is... I will take that under advisement, D. We'll see where I'm led with this one and just what happens with it. But there's also something to be said about you guys can bow out and then tune back in at another date, at another time. But anyway, so now, so... <laughs> Uh, all right, we're gonna not early like Tiffany. I'm just saying no, not, no. But you know what? I would if that's what if that's what I was I was directed to. Um, I would. I have all that stuff, and it it's all it all works because it that's because it's supposed to, because it has to, as my friend Mike says. All right. So, no, these I don't have a verse for. Come on. But, so, all right, I will take it under advisement, like I said, about um, breaking this into two parts and um, doing another part tomorrow. Um, right now, I don't think I have um, stuff scheduled for that, uh, but we'll see. We'll see, what, we'll, we'll see what I get directed to do. Okay, so I don't have the address for these, but this is something that I put down um, as part of what a week. I'm like, I'm reading through this, you know, as I'm getting preparing this all, I'm like, this happened during this, just this one week? That's crazy. So here's one of the things. It says, um, but though he performed so many signs before them, Yet, they were not believing in him. Hey, Gordon! Hello there! You were getting the feeling that we were going to go till midnight and you didn't want to miss out on it. I know you, brother. See? He, I, come on. Hello to you. So I've made it through Matthew and Mark on the first page, and I just read the first little bullet point. So, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. And now some of you would go, how could they not believe? If you've seen a miracle happen before you, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously, no two-part talks. <laughs> All right, that's why you tuned in. All right, so D has it. D said this one is from John 12, 37. I should have known you figured out where these other ones were so then you could read more about it and all that. But so he says, he had stuff happening, and people were still like, eh. I don't know. I just I I just can't get behind this guy right now. I just I That's the Israelites. <laughs> um that same stance still happens today.
because you think, well, man, obviously, if you have something going on in your life, and if I pray for you, and that thing gets better, that's a pretty cool deal. And just by that happening, they would go, hallelujah, yes, I'm in. Put the Christian stamp on me, that's, that's who I am now. But well, that's usually not how it happens. Can it happen that way? Absolutely. I've had miracles happen, miracles, signs, wonders, whatever title you want to put on it. And the people that were there that watched it, as well as the one that it happened to, the later that day and the next day, people were like, that didn't really happen, did it? I don't, I, you know, I just don't, I, I don't think, I don't, I, don't, I just don't, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not thinking that that really happened. And so having this signs, as it says here, they performed so many signs before him, yet they were not believing in him. All right, Gordon says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, we're going to chase this rabbit a little bit because repent is not performance. It's not what you do. It's not your action. Repent is a change of your mind. And you change your mind from what to what? You change your mind from I can do it. You change your mind from this is performance life. My foundation for living is based on my performance. If I do good in life, I'm going to get good in life. If I do bad in life, I'm going to get bad in life. You change that thinking. I repent of I can do these things to get into God's presence. I can be a good enough person. I can pay for my bad, my sins, which then allows me to be doing good also. And as long as I do more good than bad, that will get me into heaven. I will lean on Jesus when I need to, but it's still going to be based on me. When you have that thinking, because everybody does, that's not in Christ. Because that's all you have. You repent from that thinking to what Jesus did is enough. And if it's enough for me, it's also enough for you. Now I can look beyond what you're doing, your performance. Because now my performance doesn't matter. Now, your performance doesn't matter to me. Could it matter? Absolutely, but we're not talking about that. We're just talking about repent. I change from my performance. Now my foundation for living is his performance is enough for me to be living. And then from that... I can now love you and I can show you mercy and I can show you grace. And if you, all right, instead of if, when you do not show me mercy, show me grace. When you say you come to love me, but all I get, all I receive from you is control and manipulation, because that's all that you're doing. When, when I have that from you, and I'm living in a performance-based life, if I haven't repented yet, that's a horrible deal because now your performance is based, uh, is changing my performance and it's just ugly and you have this clash of the titans and it's just different. But when I repent, my actions in life may be identical. They may still be the same as before I repented. When I repent, 
Now my foundation for life is love. It's based on the fact that what Jesus did is enough. That's my foundation for life. Is what Jesus did enough in this situation? Go, Tom. Woohoo. Come on. Yeah, come on. Don't you know your worth? See? When you repent, because Gordon had said you uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This kingdom of God, heaven on earth. Love. How different would just the area that you live that you could walk to in an hour. So what, probably on the low side, a mile, two miles. And on the high side, a whole lot more than that. How different would life be if within walking distance of where you are right now. Good Friday night. Come on, see. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Salvation is for today. Live in your freedom. Come on, Gordon. Yes, Kevin. Come on. How different would life be if every everybody within walking distance an hour's walking distance of you. If everyone there functioned with a foundation of life being love. Now, whether it's one other, it's you and one other person, maybe you live out in the country. You know, we live out in the country. There isn't a lot of, of houses around here. Come on. Thank you, man. And maybe you, um, I know, I, I don't know, but I, I understand that where D is, is a much more populated place than where I live. See? And so if everybody in that area had the foundation of love instead of performance... See, Renee, you live in the boonies. I yes, Bigfoot. Actually, Gordon, Bigfoot is by me. There's a there's a statue in town of back in I think it was the 60s or 70s that uh, um, somebody carved of uh, what um, I don't remember what they call it, but yeah, it's a it's like a oh my goodness, it's it's like a Bigfoot type creature. Uh, D says 53,000 people on this island. Man. I believe within a, an hour's walking distance of me, if I don't, because I don't walk real fast, I believe I have one, two, three, four, five, I think I have six houses within a mile of e of, of any direction. So anyway, that in this, what I think D said that it was like John 12 or something, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. The signs, I can, I can pray for you because you're one leg shorter than the other leg. The other leg will come out. <laughs> and they would be in alignment um, I have great success with that. I, um, I, I, I looked at it one day and it, yeah, okay. John 12, 37, um, um, a while ago and out of the more than 20 people that I've prayed for, and it's much greater than that now. Um, I think my, my success rate was like 90 or 95% or something. It's just about everybody that I had done that with, it had happened. And that isn't what gets people 
to believe in God, the more powerful thing is when I'm in your life and I love you. Because just like when you pray for somebody and this miracle signs and wonders happen, that's cool. That doesn't happen every day. But neither, unfortunately, neither does love. And it cannot happen when you have a foundation of life being based on performance. That's why he says repent. He's not saying confess your goofiness, confess your shortcomings, make a list, check it twice. You're not Santa Claus. He says change the way you live life. Change the way you see life. Change the way that you have as your foundation. Because your performance right now blows. You can think you're all that and what, a bag of chips or whatever that is. But you're not. Rest in the foundation of what Jesus has done. And then live from that. You may very well be busier than you ever have been. Because it's not a lazy life. There are periods and times of rest. But it's not laziness. It's no different than you work, you do whatever through the day. Even if your work is just reading a book right now. Maybe it's just rolling your hiney out of bed. Maybe for some times, that's a heck of a feat. That needs to be applauded. And, and seriously, maybe it's that you got it up enough to be able to brush your teeth today. Maybe you ran a brush or a comb through your hair. You know, maybe that's, that, that's it. It's no different than every day you sleep. Well, you're not doing a whole lot of work there, typically. Love your neighbor. See, come on. So there are periods in your life where you can rest. And you need to rest. You don't beat yourself up during those times when you have the foundation of love because you understand that this is a time for you to rest and it's okay. This is a time for that person to be resting. This is a time for that person to be healing. When you're not performance based, you can get behind somebody that needs a period of rest. Come on. I'm glad. All right. Let's see what else we got. I'm I'm here. Okay. So the the next act so again, this happens all in this one week. So the scribes and the Pharisees go to Jesus and they're like, "All right, I got a question for you. All right, I'm going to pause there for a minute. Yeah, see, Renee, sometimes sometimes we can do it the hard the hard way because sometimes that's how how we learn. But yeah, freedom. See, and that's where this is freedom. God's not punishing you. He loves you too much to punish you. He loves you so he doesn't punish you. I know that goes against some of you guys' beliefs. If you don't believe it, then that's fine. I'm going to live that way because he doesn't punish me. He loves me. I think loving someone is the best way to help them. For God so loved the world 
What is it? The goodness of God leads somebody to repentance. Changing their mind from, if it is to be, it's up to me, to what Jesus did is enough. Psalms 23. Oh, this is good stuff. All right. So the scribes and the Pharisees confront Jesus. They're like, all right, dude. Come on, and the greatest of these is love. Yes. All right. Yes, the greatest of these is love. All right, so Renee's talking about the fact that she's stubborn, and sometimes she thinks she needs to help him. And so we can burn ourselves out in, in doing this because we're still trapped in this mindset and I'm not saying this is you Renee but I'm saying that um, we can be trapped in this I'm afraid that if I don't do something he's not going to love me anymore I'm concerned that if I don't live up to an expectation I'm going to get kicked out of the family I'm afraid i'm concerned i'm worried that if i don't perform a certain way that will show i'm not actually a believer a christian I didn't do enough, right? All of those things. Sometimes it's hard for me to um, to, to come up with the right words, but I understand. Uh, so yes, yep, I do catch myself. Yep, be and do from being. That's right, Gordon. Right? Okay, so spot on. The never will he stop loving us, no matter what we do. If we could just accept that, the problem is. Us Christians, screw that up, D. Just telling you. You and I represent, we're ambassadors for Christ. And so what happens? Somebody does something that we'll say is wrong. And maybe not us, but the world, the church, the whoever they do, the law, whatever. And instead of showing them love, we come in, instead of showing them God's love, we come in with worldly love, which is control and manipulation. Example, man, what you did was really stupid. And now I understand that that's not you, that's who, that's what you did, not who you are. And so I'm going to, um, if you're willing, I'm, I, I, I'm willing to, to help you through this time. And um, there's a few ground rules, though, if I'm going to help you through this time. Um, my expectation is that you're going to change your behavior. You go, Todd, what's wrong with that? That's not, no, I'm telling you right now, that is not God's love. That's the world's love because it's control and manipulation. I hear you, but Todd, that shouldn't be done. I'm not going to waste my time in their life if they're going to keep being stupid again and again and again and again. How many times do I have to be in their life? What was the number? Seven times 
70? 70 times 7? Basically as many times as it takes. And it doesn't mean that you're in their life always to burn yourself out. Because again, that's another worldly adaptation, um, counterfeit of God and what he does and has done for us. When you have the foundation, and I'm working on it, Valerie, I'm working on don't look at the clock, okay? I'm just, I, I hear your voice, even though I don't think I've ever heard your voice. I hear your voice in my head telling me, stop looking at the clock. I'm just telling you this. When we use a worldly understanding of love, <laughs> yeah, Gordon, you're right. It may very well, you, you may have to plug in. <laughs> the best we can hope for is a person is going to control and manipulate our lives. I'm going to be in your life and I'm going to help you and you're going to be a better person and things are going to turn out good as long as you listen to me and as long as you stop doing those things and start doing these things. Sounds an awful lot like uh, performance-based life to me. You go, okay, Todd, you smart aleck, you. How do you do that instead? All right. If I'm directed, sometimes if I'm not, because we have the freedom to be able to do it, Come on, D says, all we have to do is love them. Let God do the work. I can come into your life, and maybe we don't talk about what's going on. Maybe I'm just listening to what you have going on. You know, Todd, I just don't know why I'm doing this. I know it's wrong, but, you know, I do it anyway. I got busted for it, <clears throat> and now I'm doing it more, and... I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, I'm just, I'm just so stupid. I'm just so bad. You know, it's all my upbringing. It's, it's in my blood. It's, you know, it's my DNA. That's who I am. Well, all I'm hearing is this person doesn't understand their identity. What better thing for me to talk to you, that person about than who they are? And who they are is who God says they are. Not me, personally. Not that guy. Not that gal. Not that boss. Not that supervisor. Not that pastor clergy person. Not that police officer. Not their mom. Yeah. When I love them, I get to love them Yeah, Gordon put down John 10 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, and I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. And when you read who the thief is, because you need to back up to make sure that you understand who he's talking about into chapter 9, and then past verses 10, and... 
that having a, an abundant life has nothing to do with Satan. Well, it has nothing to do with Satan as we would understand it to be. Um, it doesn't have to do with sin from the standpoint of that being a um, the thief isn't that the thief is the one that comes into your life that preaches you need to follow the law because it brings you back into a performance-based life instead of a love-based, a Jesus-is-enough-based life. So getting into this, uh, this next, this bullet point, you have the Pharisees and the scribes coming to Jesus. And hopefully I hit on that repenting and hopefully we're, it, it's, it's good for where that is. Um, so in this, the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus. They're confronting him. They're like, hey, dude, hey, you. Pay attention to me, because I'm important. I demand, <laughs> D says we're in Luke chapter 20, verses 4 through 8. They say, I'm important. You have to listen to me and answer my question. And here my question is, by what authority do you do, you do these signs and wonders? By what authority are you teaching God's word? By what authority, by what power do you, who is telling you that this is okay for you to do this? Okay, they're all, we got him now. So then Jesus says, all right, I tell you what, I'll answer your question. But first, you have to answer mine. So what did he do there? They're all puffed up and feeling confident and going, we're at the top of the food chain here. Um, what we say you have to do. And Jesus comes back and goes, okay, I'll humor you. And I'll play by your game. This is a huge lesson. This is a big deal for us. Because he didn't go, really? I don't care if you believe me or not. I know who I am, and you're just a worm. No, he doesn't. He goes, game on. I know the game you're playing. I can play it, too. Here we go. He says, I'll answer your question after you answer mine. So just that he's asserted his dominance over them. And it's not a power play. It's a, I understand who I am. And so this is how this interaction is going to go. And he doesn't always do that, but in this way he does. In this one it is. Um, it is sad. Gord said it's sad that there's so many that don't believe. And part of the reason that they don't believe, Gordon, is because they don't run into Christians that have a foundation of love. If you call yourself a Christian, you should not have a performance-based life. Because that's a worldly life. If you're a Christian, you should have a love-based foundation. And a 1 Corinthians 13 is a good place to start. So now, 
if I don't run into somebody that says, not only says they're a Christian, if I come into contact with Valerie and our paths cross and she interacts with me that even if I don't understand it, I can look at it and go, man, you know, when I, when my life path crossed Valerie's a year ago, and now today I'm reading 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love, love, love is this, love is not that. I experienced some of those things with her. Wow. That's what a Christian is. Okay. Because I've only experienced people in life that are controlling and manipulating. <clears throat> the sad thing is, is that if I run into somebody that says, come on. Come on, Michael. Thank you. I hope you have a great night, too. Thank you for tuning in. I mean, this, that, oh, my goodness. Yeah, all right. Blessings. See, so now... There's more people, just like when I was talking about, if you have a foundation of love, that whole environment around you changes. But if you're still living a performance-based life, how can they understand love when you're still based on control and manipulation? Well, you can't. Thus, there aren't as many people that believe because they only see Christianity as control and manipulation, and they can get that anywhere. Dime a dozen. So we don't have this crazy amount of believers because Christianity does not have in general the word Christianity not real not Christianity but those that use the word Christianity still have a performance based foundation that's why there isn't more believers Okay, so Jesus has this, right? So they're like, we got him now. You tell us who's given you this authority. He says, I'll tell you. He says, after you answer my question. And my question to you is this. The baptism of John from, or was from what source? From heaven or from men? What a great question. And they're like, oh, man. They're, you know, well, if we say this, then we got a problem here. If we say that, then we got a problem there. We just, well, how are we going to answer this? So answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. Well, they knew or what they believed. Come on. <laughs> I love you, Gordon. See, just give me another hug, man. Just, uh, and tell me that before your phone dies. Yep, that's right. He said that's why people don't want to come to church, because they've spoken to a Christian who lives by performance-based life. That's right. That Absolutely. If you speak to a Christian that has a love-based life, there is no getting away from it. 
it draws you in because that's what you're searching for in life. But when you talk to somebody and they take out Buddha and they put in Jesus, because that's what some of y'all do, or some of the things that you've ran into, you're like, I can get that down the street. Really? You're treating me no different than my boss treats me. No different than my ex-spouse treats me. No different than my whatever name the person that has hurt you and harmed you. You're like, you're no different than them. And that should never be spoken of. And it is never spoken of by somebody who understands who they are and why they are a Christian. Yep, love like Jesus. Yep. So G they say that, they go, Jesus, we, we don't know. We don't know where, what source it was from heaven. From, we, don't, we don't know. And so Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He's like, nope. You guys aren't going to say that you believe that they were from man and not from, that the baptism of John. So what he's speaking about there is water baptism. Because John says the baptize the um I use water to baptize you. But when he who is before me that come, he who comes after me that is before me. So when Jesus comes, I, I used water. But when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. So here he goes. Jesus says, so the baptism of John, was it from heaven? Was it from earth or from man? They're like, we're not going to say. And he says, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to use the answer you gave me, and I'm going to give that as an answer for you. And you can't argue it because you did, you gave me the same answer. So how can it be right for you to give me that answer and wrong for me to give you that same answer? It's not. Okay. See this? See that there is so much goodness here. Man. So the last little asterisk on the first page. This is what a week. Are you serious? What a week is right. I probably could have done one of these things a little bit, starting on Sunday and going all the way through. Um, so the last one on that first page, um, wherever we're going to be for this one, uh, it says that um, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. They're like, okay, what's going on here? All right. Come on. Yeah, see, that, that would have... That, it would have been an interesting deal for sure. Come on, Gordon. Well, thank you for still tuning into our church here. Every day. Come on. See, all right. So. D says that this last one is Mark 12, 17. So the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now in this one, this one is interesting because 
he sends out, the king sends out invites. And so, so you've got a, you've got your invite. You're like, all right, I've got this. Oh, it's for April 6th. Huh. Yeah. I'm not going to make it. You know, I just got some new animals, you know, got to deal with that. Oh, no, see, oh, I got my invite, and it's for the for April 6th. Oh, you know, I got this thing happening. Oh, you know, I just got married, and so, you know, you got to do the whole marriage thing and all that. And, oh, I've got this excuse and that excuse. And everybody that was given an invite... Oh, D said Mark 22, 2 is where we're at instead. Okay, so. Barely in the sky. Come on, see, no doubt. It's just like, we're still, we're still gaining altitude, but we'll see. Because this, I mean, it is already um, well, well into our time. So. Uh, we're in Mark 22, verse 2, apparently. So nobody that the king gave an invite to was showing up at the wedding feast. So, <laughs> see, Valid, don't look at the clock. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, so he sends out his servants into the town. He's like, my banquet hall is going to have people in it. Um, go get some people. So they do. They go and they find what they believe to be the right people, the good people. <laughs> Bob Vogel, come on. You know you were here hour and a half, and it was just tough. It just Anyway, so his servants go get people, bring them back. The ones that they brought... I believe were the ones that they think that they thought would qualify to be at the king's wedding feast for his son. So you have the one group that got invites and they all turned them down. Now his servants go out and get people. And bring people in. And the king walks through. D, this can't be Mark 22. Because Mark only has 16 chapters. Um, anyway. And there's still not enough people. So he says, all right, listen to me. He says, go and get everybody. The servants are like, seriously? Is that okay? Hey, you know what? You're the boss. It's okay, D. It's all good. He says, go and get everybody. And the verse says, they got the good and the bad people. Psalms 1, like a tree planted by the water. Oh, Matthew. Oh, let's see. It says that they, they went and got all of 
the people. Verse 10, those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So I'm going to set that back aside again. Thank you, Dee. I appreciate you uh, assisting me with that. Get this picture. This is They gathered all the people they could find evil and good for the king's wedding feast for his son. And you think that it's based off of your good that you're into heaven. Oh, thank Apple. Thank Siri. Okay. All good. Either way, it's still there. You think that you getting into heaven or staying into heaven is based on your actions. This speaks directly contradictory of that, contrary to that. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to so now good and bad good evening mark glad you could join i know you're just tuning in going what this thing started at seven o'clock and it's nine o'clock now. And what? Yeah, I know. We're we're gonna just see. We're gonna we're gonna check this one out. I'm almost done with the first page. And there's four pages, so we'll see. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to. So we know where we're talking about. So heaven. And the area of heaven, even though it's not really an area, but help in your brain. <laughs> Come on. Pastor Mark, blessings, sir. I didn't know what Mark it was. And so, thank you for tuning in. Come on, D. Um, so, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to the king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And in verse, was it verse 10? Matthew 22, verse 10. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all together. Um, gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Okay. You didn't get there because you were good. And you didn't get left out because you were bad. All were gathered. So there's a big old party going on, right? Everybody's seated down. Yes, yeah, the mouth is a snare. All right, so all of the people that were pulled from the, the town are at the wedding feast for his son. And the king comes walking through. Okay, all right. And he goes, Whoom. wait a minute. How'd you get in here? Let's see what it says. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in the wedding clothes. And he said to him, 
Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Get what this is saying, okay, people? Please, just hear this. Jesus, this is this in this week that Jesus has before his crucifixion. This is just a few days. And he says, I want to drop this one on you. See if you guys can wrap your noodle around here, around this. He says, We've gathered all of the people, both good and bad. So who got an invite? Who was at this wedding feast? that had an invite, nobody. All that were there were brought in by the slaves, by the servants. They're like, come with me, come with me. Doesn't matter, just get up there. Even the person that the king looks at and goes, how'd you get in here? He got in there the same way everybody else did. What was the difference with this person? Remember? Did you hear it? The difference was, in verse 12, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? How many people put on their wedding clothes today? Yep, wedding clothes. See, the clothes. How many how many people put on armor? The armor of God? You understand that the wedding clothes, that the armor is Christ. This is saying that one person made it to the party under their own ability. They were, quote unquote, good enough because they lived a performance-based life and their life was good. So they made it to heaven. The king, God, the father, Father God, throwing a shindig, a big old party for his son, comes walking through and says, you, not the person sitting next to you that you know has done worse, or that person, or that person, or that person. It says, he looks at the one, he says, friend, how did you get in here? With, without, without wedding clothes. They were there not wearing Christ. And what happened to them? Well, in that, it says that the king told the slaves to bind them hand and foot, and kick them out of the party. Live a performance-based life. See where it gets you. Repent. Change your thinking. What Jesus did is enough. Not only for me, but also for you. My interaction with you might be, I can't be around you. That's how I'm going to show love to you. 
that's how I'm going to be able to love myself is to not have you in my life and for me not to be in your life. That's how I show love. Because my foundation for living is love. That's what I get to live by now being a Christian. That's what you get to be wrapped in. That's your foundation. That's the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And everybody that was invited, nobody showed up. And then they got the some people that they thought were good enough and left all the other ones that they knew were not up to the standard of living in the kingdom. And the king said, seriously? Pack this place out. Get everybody. And it says, all were brought. The one that sinned the most, that sinned the worst, the one that was the most horrible person from a performance-based understanding was not the one that got kicked out. The one that got kicked out was the one that wasn't wearing the wedding attire. Because it says in one of those places, Jesus is the one who makes his bride without spot or wrinkle. You don't make you without spot or wrinkle, and you can't dirty what he cleaned. If he made it white, I don't care what you do, you're not strong enough to make it dirty. You're not powerful enough to put a spot on it. Because he was the one that cleansed it, that made it holy, pure, and right. Our job now is to not believe anybody that says different. Okay, people. Here's another thing that happened in this week that Jesus is having. They go to him, and they think they're going to get him. They're like, hey, should we even pay taxes? Because, you know, we're citizens from heaven, and heaven doesn't have a tax system because it's based off of love. Why would you need a tax system if, if life was based off of love? You wouldn't, because everything would just get done. But instead, we're living in a performance-based, and you got all sorts of ugly there. So they're like, all right, we got him. Now it's Mark 12, 17. All right. So Jesus, who should pay taxes? Thinking he's going to say, well, I don't have to because I'm not under Caesar. And instead, what does he say? He says, you got a coin in your pocket? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, he pulls on, he says, you want to tell me whose picture is on there? Well, it's Caesar's picture, of course, because it's his money. He says, all right. He says, render, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God. So have you given to God the things that are God's? 
Like, um, I thought all things were God's. That's part of the reason why we give our money that is in U.S. dollars or is in the whatever country I'm in. Uh, we because it it that we and absolutely we give to organizations not to pay our tithes and our offerings we give from a love standpoint to say i want this organization to flourish and to do more to keep its lights on to keep its heat on to keep the air conditioning on yeah, D, all, or, uh, Renee, all things are from God. I get it. But in here, Jesus makes a separation. He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But give to God the things that are God's. Come on, see? Renee says, love. God is love. So now are you going to give love? You should. You go, well, I don't understand how. That's all right. It's okay. We have a time of rest. We have a time of understanding. We have a time of growing. And with a love foundation, a Jesus is enough. So now we get to love. That isn't a, I'm going to burn myself out and I'm going to do everything because I want to make sure that I'm doing right by him and I'm, no. That might be that, but more than likely it's not. More than likely you're going in eight different directions and you're doing all these other things because you're worried that if you don't, God might look at you closer and kick you out of the family because you did stuff wrong yesterday, eight years ago. And so we want to keep our head down and don't make eye contact and just hopefully that he just overlooks us. And so I want to try to make up for all the bad that I've done. So I'm going to do a lot of good. I want to be a good Christian. And I want to have everybody look at me and say that I'm a Christian because they can see all the stuff that I'm doing. I want them to check off all these boxes. No, oh, see, that's that's performance when you think like that. Is it? Because God lets us know where to go and what to do. Come on, see? Now, when you're there with like what Renee said, God tells me where to go, what to do. You don't get burnt out then. Because you're in the right place for the right season for you. Might that be a forever thing? It might. Might that be temporary? It might. Whatever it is, it's going to be right. Because as my friend says, it has to be. And so that's what we do. We do this. And maybe it's a one time. Maybe it's for a long time. Whatever it is, it's right. Give to God the things that are God's. God is love. Now, I can interact with you based on that. Might you need money? You might. I can offer that. If I don't offer it, it's because I wasn't directed to give it to you. And if I do... It was right that I offered it to you. 
whether you take it or not. It, it's just, it, it's right. Okay. Good. Sometimes learning something slowly is the best because it sticks with us. But, all right. So what a week. All right. Here's something else that happened. Oh, this one. All right. So you've got, I think it was the Sadducees. Again, titles, meh, whatever. They go to Jesus and they're like, all right, dude, we got one for you. We're going to get you between a pickle and a hard spot. Here's the scenario. Follow me now. You may need encouragement and many other things. Okay. I can be an encouragement for you if that's what you're asking. We can talk about that. but So the Sadducees, I think it is, they go to Jesus and they go, all right, here's the deal. Let me, let me, let's, let's walk through this um, because we want to, we want to, we want to hear what your, your answer is on this. He says, all right, we've got a guy, marries a wife. And then the guy dies. And so back in that day, what was custom was the guy that died, if he has a brother, the brother marries the wife, the widow now, to be able to take care of her. And then that guy dies, they say. And this, the first dude had seven brothers. So all seven brothers married this one lady. All seven of them died. They said, here's the question. In the resurrection, whose wife? Whose, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all married her. So this happened. I was like, that didn't happen on the that week before everything went crazy for it. Yeah, it did. This is part of, this is earlier in the week for what he had going on. So in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Thinking that they're going to trap him because it's like, well, if Jesus says any of them, the other six, it doesn't work because they, so here's Jesus's answer. So D says we're in Matthew 22, verses 23 through 28. Oh, and it was the, the Sadducees. Okay. Jesus replies to their answer. Come on, Valerie says, none of them. Come on, see? Now he says, he says, you are mistaken. Not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. That's where we're at. He says, you don't understand scripture, and you don't understand the power of God. For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. How many times do we... See, there's Tabitha. Just took a little while. I think I said hi to you and Stephen like, I don't know, an hour and a half ago or something, because I knew you were going to be tuning in. I'm just at the top of page two. It's been a good night so far, I think. Valerie keeps telling me to stop looking at the clock. She says it sternly, I'm sure. Maybe shaking her finger, kind of cocking her head a little bit, kind of looking out the corner of her eye a little bit. You know, it's just like that. <clears throat> hey! One of those deals. <laughs> 
Oh, he's in the Dells. Sounds like a great night. Yes. Well, thank you for tuning in a little bit here anyway. So thank you. So, so you've got this. So Jesus, they're trying to catch him. Whose wife? All seven of the brothers had her as a, as a wife in the resurrection. <laughs> Giggling, actually. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Stop looking at the clock. All right. Um, Jesus says, you don't understand scripture and you don't understand the power of God. So that should be a check for us as well to go, maybe I don't understand the scripture. Maybe I don't understand the power of God because I'm still thinking power based on performance, not based on love. I'm telling you, love will win every time. If you put love against performance in a power struggle, there's no struggle. Love beats out every time. Nothing. The greatest of these is love, as Valerie said. All right. Another thing that happened this week. It's just, what a week. This is just craziness. It says, um, wherever this, this, yep, God is love. Come on. Yeah, well, see, every time. All right. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. You see this um, somewhat of an example is when you are, before you are a Christian. All right, so D says we're in Matthew 23 now, 23 verses 11 and 12. So before you're a, a Christian, if your life, you're more on the top of the heap than under the heap in life. Life is good. Life is, life is, you're, you're more on the top. In that scenario, when you become a Christian, you can expect to be knocked down a peg or two. But if you're under the pile, outside of Christ, when you come into Christ, when you come into being a Christian, when you come into being, dying and being born again, and if you, in the outside of being Christ, you lived, you were, you, you were less than, you had the world ugly. When you are a born again believer, you can expect to be exalted, to be lifted up, because in Christ we're all the same. Yeah, God is so beautiful. So that's what this one is talking about is, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. So now if I'm in Christ and I'm trying to be, you know, all that because it's me and it's, this is my effort and I'm going to use the things of God for I can expect to be knocked down a peg or two. And if I'm meek and just this, I can be looked at to be helped up and assisted up. I like the overall analogy of this is when you're outside of Christ and there's a definite hierarchy of people, when you come into Christ, God levels that out. He he brings some lower and he raises some up. All one. One of the times, I don't know, years ago, God had told me, he said, Todd, he said, you can make your life about you or I can, but we both cannot. 
didn't take me long. I'm like, have at it. So I don't have plans as to what I'm going to do when unless he tells me that this is what's going to be happening. Otherwise, it's all good. All right. Oh, this is, all right. Let's move on to the next one. Again, not another one with a verse. It says, so here's Jesus. And this is early on. I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe Tuesday. Yes, Jesus, take the wheel. See, all right. So now here's Jesus. It is early in the week. I don't remember. Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe, I don't know. But it's 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 not late. Jesus says, he says, now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Uh, D says we're in John 12, verses 27 and 28. So here's Jesus going, um, I'm having some challenges. So if you have a challenge, you're in good company. So did Jesus. Now my soul has become troubled. But because he has the foundation of love, while he's living in a performance-based, before everything was accomplished, before everything was finished, he says, what shall I say? So what that I'm troubled? That pales in comparison to why I'm here. I'm here because God so loved the world. I'm here to fulfill these things that need to be done so that all you all can live this righteousness, can live in this holy and blameless and beyond reproach life, not based on your own doing, but based on mine. He says, I'm here. He says, what am I going to do? Ask the Father to save me from this? Because he was, he was going, you know, if you were in my shoes, that's what you'd be doing right now. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask him for help. It's not what he's saying. Hear his words. He says, this is why I'm here. For this person, purpose, I came to this hour. He says, why would I stop now? I'm not going to like it. It's not going to be fun. There's no, there's no pleasure in it from my flesh. But we read somewhere that it says that it was of God's good pleasure for what Jesus went through. Not because he's sadistic. I think said whatever, whatever that word is. You guys know what I'm talking about. No. It was acceptable because he knew it had to be done in order for you and I not to have to go through it. For, for a lot of us, we will take the pain if it means that our child doesn't have to go through it as long as our child is not missing out on a learning a life lesson and understanding how to live better. He's saying... 
my soul has become troubled. What should I say? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? Because you know it would have happened if he did. But you also know that there was no way he could. Because he loves us. He loves you and me too much. He's like, seriously? Do you really think that that's what I'm going to say? Because again, words have power. Father, save me from this hour. He says, do you even think I'm going to utter that? I'm going to even think that that's what I should do? That's foolish talk. That's not me. This is why I came. And he says, Father, glorify your name. And then God speaks from the heavens. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And then, as just a quick side note, in John chapter 17, Jesus says, The glory that has been given to me, I give to you. And not just the people that he was talking about, but to you, and to you, and to you, and to you. Sharon, to you, all of you. Such goodness. All right. Now, Matthew 24, because we were just in 23, I think. See us, John 3.16. Yep. Oh, we were in John 12. Okay. So, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay. So in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 13, there's a lot here. One of the things is um, his disciples are, are coming to Jesus going, um, let us in on what's going on. And Jesus is like, you know what? Just don't be deceived. People are going to be coming to you, but don't, don't be freaked out about that. You're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. And how can you be frightened if you're living with a foundation of love? There's wars, rumors of wars, all the crazy, whatever. Don't lose this love. Understand that that's just famines and earthquakes and stuff, all that stuff, it's going to happen. Um, and... Verse 10, it says, At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets, so many people that are speaking what they say is what God said. Many of many people that are wrong, not just the fact that they got a word wrong, but that God didn't tell them to say, that, say it. They will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, that person will be saved. Lawlessness only happens living a performance-based life. That's the only place you can have lawlessness. You cannot have law. Lawlessness is not available with a foundation of love. It's just not. Can't it, it? It. There is no foundation for it. There's no way you can have it. Any way you look at it, any way you use it, any way. You cannot have lawlessness. 
Doesn't mean that you can't screw up. Doesn't mean that um, any of those, the, the words that would be used, doesn't mean that those don't happen. But you have mercy and grace. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. How do you have lawlessness then? You don't. How do you treat somebody poorly? You don't. All right, what else? Um, here's one I don't have the address for. It says, uh, then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So you got the so in this week he talks about the the ten virgins. Half of them take their lamps as well as oil, and the other half just take the lamps and don't have the oil. And you can argue because then um, in the middle of the night they get word that the bridegroom is coming, and they're like, okay, we're in Matthew 25. Ooh, we're getting close. The five that don't have oil go to the five that do and go, hey, share yours with ours because we're going to be running out. And the five that have it are like, no, you're going to have to get your own. Which you could argue that isn't love. And we're not going to apparently get into that one more tonight. Just understand that that is love in this case. Because then the bridegroom, so the, the five that don't have the oil, enough oil go into town to get some. The bridegroom comes, has the five, and then they go in and shut the door. And then the five that had to go get some more oil, when they came back out, they missed the boat. So that's talked about during this week. How about the talents? Uh, the guy went on a journey, and he gave his slaves. One of them, he gave five talents, another two, another one one, according to their own ability, and then he went on his journey. So, so that one was talked about during this week that Jesus has. To me, that's just that, that that's craziness to me. I, my brain is not. I was I was I was amazed that that one happened here. Okay, here's another one. I don't know where this one is either, but maybe somebody will some maybe maybe somebody will tell all y'all where the verse is. Verses are. It says, "But when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him." Yeah, busy week. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right. So this is my right. And the goats... On his left, where are we at? We're in Matthew 25, 31 and further. Who's separating? Who's, who's doing this? It's us, right? We're, us Christians are separating the sheep from the goats. And we're, no, at that time, Jesus is doing it. And he's saying, all right, angels, separate. Jesus separates them. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. All right, so sorry. So the king, so King Jesus. 
He says we're at 25, 31 through 46. There we go. So Jesus says to those that he put on his right, he says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The king will answer and say to them, Oh, because the other part, they're like, Why do we get in? What? How how's this work? And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So when you showed love, you're showing love to me. When you show love to that person. That's good enough for me. That means you understand that I love you. And then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And they're like, whoa, wait a minute. What? Hold on a second here. Why? And his response, then he will answer them. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just like the king walks through the banquet hall and says, wait a minute, where's your wedding attire? You don't have it, you get out. And not even get out because we're going to haul you out. So you have that. Here's another thing that happens this week. Jesus cries out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but believes in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. Let me, okay, fine. I'll, somebody said, read that again. All right. It says, if anyone hears my sayings, here's what I'm saying, and does them, whoops, let's see. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep my sayings, I do not judge them. We're in John 12, 44 through 47. Thanks, D. I sure do appreciate that. Thank you. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. This is in this week. Here's something. This is so Matthew 26, verses 1 and 2. See, we're getting closer now. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that 
after two days, the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Wow! I mean, how could you even function knowing what's coming up just in a couple days, just in a little bit? In this case, not even a couple of days. He says, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. So it's right around the corner. How could you even have just the wherewithal to be able to say stuff? And there's so much that he covers yet. So after he says this, then he has the Lord's Supper. And we're not going to even get into that. That's just something that happens. Now, from a time frame, all the stuff that I talked about, so him coming in on the donkey up until... Now, the Lord's Supper, that all happened then. Now we have the Lord's Supper. And then after that, he says, here's one of the things I did. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Oh, see, isn't that? I mean, it just, Renee commented, D agreed, that, you know, your mind would just be just, wow. So when somebody says you need to um, act in um, faith and truth, or um, truth and whatever that, that saying is, Jesus is the truth. The truth is, and I don't get to come to you and go, I get to deal with the truth with you, and the truth is you're a screw-up. The truth is you're a moron. The truth is you're an idiot. The truth is, no, none of that stuff is right. When I come to you and speak the truth, Jesus is the truth. That's what we get to interact with. So he said that after the Lord's Supper. Something else he said was, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. There's some confidence in identity. We're in John 14, 17. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So when somebody meets us, they should have a God so loved the world experience. Not to put pressure on you, because if it doesn't happen, again, foundation of love. But they very well could walk away with thinking in their mind, I just experienced Jesus. Not that you are Jesus, but you're one with him. How about John chapter 14? So we're already there. We go move down a few verses, 16 through 21. He says, I will ask the Father, so here's Jesus again talking, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, 
because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. So D says, John 14, 15, as if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All right. So, and what are his commandments? The Ten Commandments? Nope. All the other 600 plus? Nope. 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 John 15, 17 says, This I command you, that you love one another. Somewhere else it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. So, in John 14, where it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Love. That's the commandment. I'm telling you right now, you're not even, you're not following that. Why would you even think about trying to follow the other stuff? Oh, that's right, because you think that you can get there by doing the other stuff. When love trumps the other stuff. Love far exceeds the other stuff. All of it. Honor your mother and your father. Don't cover, covet your neighbor's stuff. Don't, thou shall not kill, which is murder. Thou shall, no. The commandment is love one another. That's how this thing works. Oh, well, here's one I jumped over. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Do not. And then the verses with, I am the true vine and the Father is the vine dresser, that chunk of verses that talks about that the branch was cut off and that you were grafted in, and don't be too cocky about that, because if God has enough power to graft in a wild olive branch, that the one that he cut off, he can also bring back in, so don't get too high and mighty about your position. That one is after the Lord's Supper, John 15. So that's where we're, this is, so... He has the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper, during the Lord's Supper, he goes over to Judas and he says, all right, go do what uh, you're supposed to do. Which is go and tattle on him and tell them where Jesus is going to be. And then, so, he gives this stuff after. The, what a week. Man. Okay, let's see. Um, he also says, you know, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And these things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. 
in the world, you have tribulation. Don't be in the world. You're in the world, not of the world. So the world has tribulation. In me, you have peace, even during the tribulation. All the issues challenge. He says, take courage. I have overcome the world. If he's overcome the world, does that mean that you have to do what it takes to overcome the world? No. You get to rest in the fact that he's overcome the world. Oh. John 16, 33 is where we were at with that. Um, let's see. John 17 is some good stuff. John 17 is Jesus praying out loud. He's talking to the Father like he does when nobody else hears him. So he's saying, people, this is how I talk to our, our Father. So I'm going to read just part of it. Uh, 13 through 23, it says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So if I pause here, understand. So Jesus and God the Father, Jesus is talking. And so this, they and them, and that, that is you and I. So he says, when I, that's Jesus, come to you, that's the Father. Them is you and us, you and me. So he says, in us, that's the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? So now that we have all the people. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Stop thinking that you're made of the dust, of the dirt of the world. No longer are you, because now you're a spirit-born person. Okay. He says in 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. So if I pause right there at the end of 15, if he, if Jesus said to the fig tree, may no one eat fruit from you ever again. So he said that and it happened. Now he's talking to the father and he says, I'm asking you to keep them from the evil one. What's the chances that the evil one can get you? None. Stop giving him credit. Just because you're having a sucky day doesn't mean that the devil is beating up on you. Zero. Zero. That's right. Zero. This is... He, sa he says it. He says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but here's what I do ask. I ask you to keep them from the evil one. He says, they, which is us, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Man. Okay. Verse 17, sanctify them in your truth. So are you trying to be sanctified on your own? Jesus just told God, he says, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. 
and here you are thinking you're good enough to sanctify yourself. Get over yourself. You're not that good. And then verse 20, such a good verse. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. So on these people that are hearing me, I don't ask just on, on, on the people that can hear my voice, but for those who believe in me through their word. That's who I'm also saying this to and for. That they all may be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? Well, so that the world may, be may believe that you sent me. That's the unity. You and I being unified is to show the world that God the Father sent the Son. Verse 22, the glory, here it is, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me. And love them even as you have loved me. Man, is that powerful stuff. Yes. Oh. All right. We are starting to starting to, to make our descent. Uh, Luke 22, verses 47 through 53. So here's, so this whole week, this is just this week of Jesus' life. After the Lord's Supper, that we would call the Lord's Supper. So after that, he has all these things. Luke 22, verses 47 through 53. So here it is. He says, while he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came. And the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas... Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was happening, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? It's like, all right. What is it? Let's throw hands, right? Let's get into it. Let's do this. Verse 50. And one of them, which was Peter, but and one of them, struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. <laughs> but And I shouldn't laugh, but it is. But Jesus answered and said, Stop. No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then G you would think that that would be enough to have the people that were coming against Jesus to be like, We're out. That was way cool. But again, when you see signs and miracles and wonders, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change your mind. Um, let's see, verse 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. So now you have all that. And then on the sheet, I have, oh, it's a little blurry, but I have three T's. I have the, a lowercase t, a capital T, and a lowercase t. So you've got, now is the crucifixion time. So now he goes through all of that stuff. And one of the guys was talking about the fact that he was at a meeting and the presenter went up to the dry erase board and drew these three T's. 
the, 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 the little T and the capital T and the little T. So Jesus is on the capital T in the middle, and then on the left and right of him, he has the other, um, the other um, two people that are being crucified with him. And then that's where the ones um, is mocking Jesus. He says, hey, if you are, um, get us all down. You know, stop messing around. And the other one's like, don't you have any respect? Please, you know, remember me. And Jesus turns to that one and he says, you will be with me in heaven, in paradise today. So you have all of that. All of that happens. And one of the things I would suggest is if you don't have the sheets, draw it. Just, just take, take your, your notebook, your piece of paper, and just draw a little T and a big T and a little T. And just sit and look at that for a little bit. Don't say anything. He said the the one uh, person had said that that's all the presenter came in up on the dry erase board, drew a little T, drew a capital T, drew a little T, and didn't say anything. And after like 15 minutes, just about everybody in there was on the verge of crying or was crying. Just powerful stuff. Okay. So what a week. Man. So now, ending this, Matthew 27, 57 through 66, says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, whatever, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus, a student of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Jesus ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb. Because they... They recycled the tombs. They would have the place where the body would be laid, roll the, the stone in front of it so then the critters won't get in there and keep some of the smell up in there. And then after the body would decompose, they would wipe all of the what was left and it would go into a, a box that would be like above where their head would be kind of a deal. They would wipe that, it would fall into there from what I'm remembering. And then they would put another body in there. So this is a new tomb, nobody's been there yet, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Verse 61, and Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. So just because Jesus is dead, the guys that opposed him aren't done yet. They need to make sure that things go their way. And I, I, I have experience with people such as this. Years, two or three anyway after they're still making sure even though there's no discussion they're still making sure that they taint the view of whoever but all right verse 63 and said sir we remember that when Jesus, he was still alive. That deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders 
for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go, make it as secure as you know. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. What a week. And I obviously, I, so we didn't get into the Lord's Supper. We didn't get into all of the stuff with the crucifixion and the fact that he was beat beyond recognition of a man. There's one verse that says that every bone of his was exposed. Come on. No, that's a week. See, and there's so much goodness there. Man. And he did it so that we didn't have to. Now, I don't have to punish you for the bad that you did to, not me, to that other person. See, I don't have to punish you now. Now, maybe I'm not in your life because it's just not best, but maybe I'm in your life, but I can look beyond what's going on and what you've done or what you're doing to see the fact that what Jesus, the punishment that Jesus took was enough for you. And now it was enough for me to be able to love you in a way that I need to, that you need me to in this moment of time. This week was crazy because it was all chucked full of goodness and love. He's loving on you. He's loving on me. He's, he's loving on people. He goes, all right, well, here, here's something else. Here's a, here's a nugget for you. Here's something that you can take to the bank. Here's something that you can remember. Here, this will be a good thing for you to look at life this way. Here's this. Here's this. Here's this. Here's this. Yeah, I know, man, my soul is troubled. But that's why I'm here. Here you go. Here's something else. Here's something else. Here's something else. All right, it's about that time, uh, Judas. You need to go uh, deal with your, yeah, go. Here's some more. This is good. Oh, see, now here, how about, and it just goes on, and it's just crazy. And I really think that his ministry life, so that three years, three and a half years, whatever, that that's just what it was. Because because how could you not? When you have the foundation of life, of love, not performance, but love, you're always, always, acting that way. It looks different all the time. There is, there, it, it, always. Man, what a week. Now this Sunday is Easter, and it's the, the first time that we're going to uh, be doing what we do um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. We're going to do that uh, on one Sunday a month. And that one Sunday is going to be the second Sunday. And April, second Sunday, is Easter. And so uh, we're going to be doing communion. And um, after uh, we do our hour and a half discussion, the open discussion that we have on Tuesday and Thursdays, or Tuesday and Wednesdays. That's what our Sunday is going to look like as well, with the addition of communion, and then we're going to have a meal afterwards. And so, uh, moving forward, then, so the second, the second Sunday in May and June and all that, um, the time frame might change a little bit, but. For Easter, it's going to be um, at uh, 4 o'clock. And so we'll go from 4 until 5.30, and then I have a meal at 5.30. Um, 
And so we might change that a little bit, but we'll see. Uh, so, um, Sunday is going to be the, the first time that we talk about the new um, topic for that week. So like this week we had Tuesday and Wednesday, and then next week we'll have Sunday and Wednesday. And then the following week we'll have Tuesday and Wednesday. And so, but for the title for the um, discussion that we'll have, the topic that we'll have um, for Sunday for Easter and then for Wednesday and then Thursday, um, our church time here, uh, the, the title topic, at least as it stands right now, is now what? Because we had what a week tonight. What a week. Now Jesus has been buried. Well, Sunday, he's not there anymore. He has risen. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Come on, see? Now what? So how do we apply this to our life now? Because I think we can take some of the stuff, hopefully, the stuff that we talked about tonight, and be able to apply it to our lives. Even if you're applying it to your life to gain a better understanding of your identity as to who Christ says you are. Who God says you are, who the who the Father says you are, who Holy Spirit says you are, who Jesus says you are, because of what they have done. Even if that's what it is. And hopefully it goes beyond that to help you with interacting with people. Maybe you don't receive the ugly, pukey stuff that happens in the world. Maybe you you don't you don't take that as much as you have whatever the case may be. That's how we get to do this. Hopefully this has been an encouragement for you. And I am telling you, you all have been a great encouragement for me. And so Valerie kept telling me to stop looking at the clock and which was an encouragement to me because we would not have gone this long, but it was right. And thank you all for sticking with me, sticking with us this whole time. Come on, what a blessing. Thank you. And so with that, I'm going to say, Thank you. Uh, thank you for the comments again. Thank you for the, the views. Thank you for sharing this. Um, what, a, what a blessing and an encouragement. Come on. Love you too, Renee. I love you all. It is such a wonderful way to go through life with having you in my life. Thank you. And let's do this again next week. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>